Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our third uh, lecture. Uh, this lecture is a combined lecture for both uh, the Calc and non-Calc students and uh, it's on fluids. Okay, we'll actually do two topics on fluids, fluid statics and we'll do fluid dynamics. Okay, fluid statics being the physics of fluids that are not flowing and fluid dynamics being the physics of fluids that are flowing. Okay, so before we get into that, uh, I should tell you what a fluid is. So if you look at how the course has progressed up to this point, uh, the first thing we did was uh, static equilibrium. And uh, that was the physics of uh, rigid objects uh, that are not moving, okay? So a rigid object is uh, basically a solid, but it's a solid which does not deform when uh, forces or torques are applied to it, okay? And uh, um, that was our first topic. The second topic was uh, elasticity. And those are still rigid objects, okay, they're still solids, but these are solids where you're going to apply enough force that they begin to deform, okay. Now lots of different things can happen when they deform, but we only looked at what was called uh, the, the elastic limit or forces within the elastic limit, and that is, you know, you apply a force, the uh, object deforms, and then you let go and it springs back to its original form, okay. Both of those are solids, okay, and so solid is uh, um, an object which basically retains both its shape and its volume over time. Time, all right, and uh, the reason that happens at the microscopic level, uh, even though we're not going to really go into the microscopics, but the reason that happens at the microscopic level is because the atoms and molecules are locked together by bonds that are directional, okay, like covalent bonds, if you know about them. So things like uh, like diamond is a very good example where, you know, there are bonds and they're in a particular direction and, and all the atoms and molecules are locked together like Lego blocks. And if you grab one end of the object, you know, and you shake it, well, because of the, uh, the attachment, the directional attachment uh, through the bonds to the neighboring atoms, they'll move along with it and those ones will move along with it. And then, you know, if you have like uh, my remote here, you know, I can grab it at the one end here, and I could shake it here and the, the motion continues all the way along it. Okay, so that's a, um, that's a solid, right? Uh, uh, fluids are either liquids or gases. You can refer to both of them as uh, fluids, okay? Uh, liquids are generally um, uh, incompressible uh, fluids. That is a fluid which is difficult to compress, okay? And what's happening there at the microscopic level is that the uh, atoms or molecules are very close to one another. They're held close to one another by uh, the electrostatic forces, but um, they're not directional. So the, the atoms or molecules can tumble over one another, like water being made out of H2O. Okay, the H2O molecules can just sort of tumble over one another. They like to stick together. They don't like to be pulled apart. You pull them apart, they'll want to come back together. But but they're not stuck. They're not locked together like you know with le like Lego blocks. Okay, and, and like in a solid, they'll they'll just tumble over one another. Okay, as a result, a fluid, or sorry, a liquid, when you pour it, uh, and you you know this because everyone's poured water, it'll it'll retain its volume. That is the 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 amount of air um, volume that it uh, fills up remains the same but it'll simply take on the shape of its container, okay? And again, you could just picture these uh, uh, molecules just kind of tumbling over one another until they, you know, just fill up the container, but because they want to stick close to one another, the, the volume of the, the total volume remains the same, okay? So that's a liquid, and that's what's happening at the microscopic level. A gas, on the other hand, uh, the, the uh, atoms or molecules are, are just far apart, okay? And they generally you know, they, they don't interact, okay? And actually, when we talk about ideal gases, when we get to thermodynamics, these uh, atoms or molecules, depending on what the gas is made out of, it could be made out of atoms like helium or it could be made out of molecules like O2, oxygen, okay? But whether it's one or the other, you know, atom or a molecule, you know, they just fly past one another and they tend to miss one another. In an ideal gas, they never see one another or extremely rarely. In a less than ideal gas, you know, they'll see one another, but they'll just sort of, they have these glancing blows, you know, they're just sort of pass by one another and interact a little bit, but nothing like a liquid where they're like literally touching one another and, and just tumbling over one another, uh, or, or even worse, a, a solid uh, where they're, they're locked together in a particular uh, matrix. Okay, so um, when we talk about fluids, uh, we're mostly going to be talking about liquids, but in some cases it'll apply to gases too. When we say fluid, we actually mean both of them. Uh, and uh, you know these as the three states of matter, you know, like uh, if you have uh, uh, water, uh, water when it's very cold is in a solid form, all right, and when you heat it up more, it'll, it'll 
the, the ice will melt and you'll get a liquid form. And then when you heat it up more, it'll eventually boil and become a gas form. So these are correspond to the three states of matter. Um, not to go off on this, but there's actually even more than just three states of matter. Uh, there's plasmas, which is like lightning or, you know, the gases inside of a neon a bulb, which is kind of like a gas, but it's a gas where the electrons have been liberated from the atoms and that behaves differently. And you'll be amazed at this, but uh, like ice, uh, we only have one type of ice on Earth, but under a lot of pressure, there's actually seven different types of ice. OK, so, you know, how those molecules will actually lock themselves together uh, at the microscopic level will depend on how much pressure is on that ice. So it, it's a very complicated, uh, it can get very complicated depending on the microscopics. Again, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to do in the course, but I thought I should, you know, uh, tie it into, you know, some of the underlying chemistry. OK, so, uh, you know, if you want to picture something, you could picture water or, or uh, ethanol uh, type of alcohol uh, or something like that. OK, so mostly that. And uh, every once in a while, this will also apply to gases, but mostly we're going to be talking about liquids. So even though I say fluid statics and fluid dynamics, it will apply mostly to liquids, but sometimes the gases too. OK, so. Um, all right, let's let's begin here um, talking about fluid statics. The first thing is, um, you know, remember when we did uh, Newton's laws, you know, uh, I had to introduce uh, mass. I said this object has a certain mass, okay? But mass doesn't work quite as well when we're talking about fluids. It does because I can just, you know, take my remote here and say, look, it, it just has a certain weight, okay? I put it on a scale and I can measure its weight in Newtons and then, you know, divide by 9.8 in meters per second squared and get its mass in uh, in kilograms okay so there's a certain amount of substance there but it doesn't quite make as, as much sense for for liquid because you know you could have a lot of the liquid or a little bit of the liquid and the liquid could break apart into you know different streams and things like that and so generally speaking it's better to talk about the liquid uh, in terms of its density okay and what is density you've probably seen it before it's defined right here okay so the density of a fluid it's given the symbol rho okay uh, spelled in english r-h-o pronounced rho as in row, row, row your boat, okay? Uh, and it, it, it's the Greek letter row, okay? Um, sometimes people will use a D, but in physics, we've got so many symbols, like if I use a D, it'll be confused for something else like distance, okay? So generally we'll use row, and it's equal to the mass divided by the volume of some uh, amount of fluid, okay? So you have some volume of fluid, and you measure the, uh, the mass of that, and you take the mass divided by the volume, and that's going to give you the density, okay? And the reason this is a useful number is because generally the density of, of liquids doesn't change much, okay? Uh, that's what's meant by an incompressible uh, fluid. It's a fluid uh, like, like water, which is generally speaking, has the same density. It changes a little bit depending on temperature and pressure, but not a lot. A gas does, okay? So the density of a gas is not characteristic of the gas, but the density of a liquid is characteristic of the liquid. And we'll see that in some of the problems that we do in a minute, okay? So generally, we're not gonna work in terms of mass. Wherever you see mass, or wherever you would have seen mass, talking about the dynamics of objects, we're going to be talking about the density of the fluid, okay? And the units of density are pretty easy. It's uh, just, you know, units of uh, mass divided by units of volume, and that's in MKS kilograms per meter cubed, okay? So there you go. There's uh, uh, density. Now, um, the density of water is a very special number, okay? The density of water is, uh, you might have seen this in your other courses, it's one gram per cubic centimeter, and that seems a little suspicious. You say, how in the world did it come out to be exactly one gram per cubic centimeter? So you know how big a centimeter is. It's about that big. Okay, a hundredth of a meter. All right. And imagine a cube of that. Okay, so a length of one centimeter, width and height of one centimeter. Okay, and of water. And you weigh that and it turns out to be exactly one gram. Okay. And the reason is, is because they made it that way. When they set up the metric system, they wanted to make all the units uh, conformable to one another. And they had to decide on a mass unit. And they just said, you know what, uh, what should we, uh, what should we choose for our, our unit of mass? And they said, how about uh, one cubic centimeter of water because water is the most common uh, element on earth and so uh, element sorry uh, most common material on earth and so one uh, that's the density of um, of water okay by the way uh, cubic centimeter is um, uh, correct but you might see again in other courses you might see a milliliter 
okay like in chemistry you tend to use liters and milliliters you know with those graduated cylinders and it turns out that one milliliter is exactly one cubic centimeter okay by definition okay so uh, i'll tend to use i won't use milliliters M maybe i'll mention them in passing uh but you know like if you hear in another course milliliters just think of that as a cubic centimeter okay now one gram per cubic centimeter that is not mks it's, it's correct but it's not mks so let's convert that from grams to cubic centimeters to kilograms per cubic meters okay and that's what I did right here all right so uh, if you have one gram per cubic uh, centimeter okay so there it is there now we need to multiply by those conversion fractions okay so for the to convert the gram and grams in the uh, numerator so we'll put it here in the denominator and a thousand grams is equal to one kilogram so this fraction right here is one okay now the cubic centimeter there are three of them Okay, remember we saw that last time with square centimeters. So here a cubic centimeter, we actually have to do, do the conversion fraction three times, one for each of the, the centimeters in centimeter cube, because a cubic centimeter is a centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter. So here it is. You could see the cube there because you need to multiply by this three times. All right. And we want to go from centimeter in the denominator here so we'll put it in the numerator here to meters and it's 100 centimeters is one meter so there's the conversion fact fraction there just multiply this all out okay and um, uh, on top you're going to have 100 cubed okay, there it is on the bottom you're going to have a thousand and that turns out to be a thousand kilograms per cubic meter okay so this is a number you'll probably want to memorize because it's it's a very easy conversion and there's so many places where you'll see the density given to you in grams per cubic uh, centimeter okay both within the course and outside of the course all right because it's a very common unit for density uh, but you know for our purposes we got to work at mks and so you're going to have to convert that to uh, kilograms per cubic meters now you can go through the whole process all over again but but why you just know that one gram per cubic centimeter is equal to a thousand kilograms per cubic meter okay and that's also the density of water so if i asked what is the density of water in mks units <clears throat> the answer would be a thousand kilograms per cubic meter okay so there you go uh all right now let's uh, let's start jumping into some um uh fluid static properties okay so so static means the fluid is not flowing so what kind of questions could we ask here? Well, uh, I assume most of you have gone swimming and if you've gone swimming, you know, uh, you like to go underwater and you know that as you dive deeper and deeper into that pool or, or the lake or ocean, wherever you happen to be swimming, you start to feel the pressure on your ears. OK, so, you know, the deeper down you go inside of water, the more pressure there is. Conversely, if you do mountain climbing or you're flying a plane or something like that, although planes, you know, they tend to pressurize the cabin. But, you know, as you go up, the pressure drops and you feel that in your ears as well okay and so uh there's clearly some relationship between how deep you are in, inside of a fluid and what the pressure is on the object okay and so uh let's again do it for a liquid for water all right so um generally you know as you start to go down deeper into the liquid the pressure increases is there a formula for that Okay, so I'm actually going to drive that formula for you rather than just give it to you because the derivation is easy and it gives you some intuition into what's going on here. Okay, so uh, this picture that I've drawn here, it's, it, it might be difficult to, to, to decipher, but uh, let me walk you through it. So this is like a huge beaker or a pool or something like that. Okay, so this is a container. And inside the container, there's water. You can see here there's a fluid line or, or any fluid, any fluid, okay? And down here, there's an object. And I didn't draw the full object. All I did is I drew the top of the object, or actually not even the top, but the cross-sectional area of the object. I mean, any object that's submerged has some cross-sectional area, okay? And so all I'm doing here is drawing a cross-sectional area. We'll call that cross-sectional area A, okay? So cross-sectional area means, you know, like, you know, if you, if you were to just like look down on the object, it would have some area associated with it. I know it's three dimensional, but just look at look down on an object and you would see that, it, you know, no matter what the outline is, it has some area associated with that perimeter. OK, I drew it here as a square because it's as easy. It's easy to see. OK, so that that square, which I've ha hashed in there, has some cross sectional area H. OK, now it's submerged in the fluid and it's submerged at a distance H, which I have there. OK, and then you see these lines that I have going up. Those lines are supposed to say that's all the fluid which is directly above that cross-sectional area, 
Okay, so so uh, you know the lines aren't there in reality; they're construction lines. But just imagine all of the fluid that's above you. Okay, and that fluid that's above above you or above the object. Okay, that fluid that's above the object. Um, it has a weight associated with it. And because this is in a gravitational field, that weight is pushing down on that object and that's what's causing the pressure on the object. Now, water is pretty dense. And so as you start to go down in water, there's more and more water above you. I mean, you could be sitting at the bottom of the pool, you look up and there's all this water above you that's weighing down on you. That's what's causing the pressure on you, okay? And obviously the deeper you go into the pool, the more water there is above you, the more pressure there is. Even the atmospheric pressure, like, you know, on, at the Earth's surface, there's an atmospheric pressure. We'll talk about that a little later. And that pressure that's on you, that's because of the weight of the air above you. If you go, if you look straight above you, all that air that's straight above you, all the way out of, into space, it has a weight. And that weight is weighing down on you, and that's what's creating the pressure. Okay? You say, well, how would I ever get a formula for that? Well, let's, let's do it. So here... Fg, that's the force of gravity on that object, okay? And what's causing that force of gravity? Well, the weight of all the fluid above it. And so that fluid above it has some mass m, and of course there's g because of the acceleration due to gravity, okay? So this is basically the weight of all the fluid above that object. All right, now we don't want to work in m because we're talking about a fluid. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace it with the density. Now uh, above I had rho is equal to m over v. Just rearrange that and you'll get that the mass is equal to the density times the volume. Now what is that volume? That's the volume of all this fluid above you right in here inside of this uh, um, um, rectangular cuboid there. Okay. So uh, whatever that weight is, or sorry, whatever that volume is, that's v, multiply it by the density and that'll be the mass of that fluid. Okay. So that's what this V is. It's the volume of all of the fluid above the object. Okay. And so I'm just going to put that in here and, then, and that's going to give me that the weight of that fluid above the object is the density times the volume times G. And now the volume here, if you think about it, you go, well, how could I write that? And you realize that the volume, and we're going to see this a lot um, throughout this section, okay volume if you've got something which is cuboid uh, it's going to be a length times a width times a height okay so you know if you wanted to know the um, uh, the amount of air in your room okay uh, what would you do you'd measure the length of the room you'd measure the width of the room now if you multiply just those two together length and the width of the room that gives you the area of the floor okay but then if you take that area of the floor and multiply it by the height of the room that gives you the volume of the room and that's exactly what we're going to do here here if I multiply the width and the, uh, and the length here, so the length and the width here, okay, that's going to give me that cross-sectional area, A. But then if I take that A and I multiply it by H, that gives me the volume. And so over here, I can take the volume and replace it by the area of the object, the cross-sectional area of the object, multiplied by H like that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by A. And so over here, I've got the weight of the object, sorry, the weight of the fluid above the object divided by the, the cross-sectional area, and that's equal to rho gh, okay? And you say to yourself, well, what is this f over a? And you should remember from the previous lecture, if you have a force and it's distributed over an area a, a force distributed over an area, that's a pressure, okay? And that's exactly the pressure. So the pressure p here, which is the pressure due to the weight of the fluid above the object, okay? So the fluid above the object has a weight. That weight is distributed over some area. So the weight divided by that area, that's the pressure. And what's that going to equal? Well, it turns out to be equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by G multiplied by H. Okay? And so that's the formula we're going to use in a second to solve problems. Let's just see if it makes intuitive sense. Well, mostly, you know, we, we go we go swimming in water. I mean, oh, well, we go swimming in either fresh water or salt water. Okay, and so there's a difference. There's a difference. And uh, if you've ever been to to Israel to the Dead Sea, uh, there's a, a lake there. Well, a Dead Sea, uh, which is uh, actually very dense. Okay, it's so dense that you you practically can't even go. You can't really go swimming in it because you just float on top of it. Okay, so so there are different densities of water, right? And as you go down deeper into the water, depending on you know the density of, of whether it's fresh water or salt water, you're going to get more pressure on you for the same depth in 
more dense than less dense. Okay, so the density affects how much pressure is on you. Kind of makes sense. Okay, gravity affects how much pressure there's on you. But we only go swimming on Earth. Okay, so so you don't know any different. But I mean, if you know you if you had a pool on the Moon, uh, and you went down to the same depth as the as same pool on Earth, you wouldn't feel as much because the gravity would be less on the moon. And so the weight of the fluid on you would be less, okay? But you know, that's kind of fixed here on Earth. And of course, H, the deeper you go down into the fluid, the more pressure there's gonna be on you, okay? So the pressure on, the, on an object which is submerged, it doesn't really depend on the shape of the object or the cross-sectional area of the object or any of the geometr geometrical properties. It just depends on the density of the fluid, G and H. Okay, so there's the formula that <clears throat> tells you what the pressure is on an object that's been submerged a distance H into um, the fluid. All right, so we could do some problems with this. We'll do a couple of problems. All right, so uh, what's the pressure of, on, a, on a swimmer submerged 10 meters in water? Okay, so um, a swimmer goes down 10 meters. Now, 10 meters is very deep. Uh, I doubt most of us could do it unless you're a professional swimmer. That's like 30 feet, so that's that's a pretty serious depth. But I, I picked that number uh, on purpose. You'll see why in a minute. Okay, so P is equal to rho GH. Okay, so what's rho? Well, rho is the density of water, okay, assuming fresh water, okay, and we know that number. In MKS, it's a thousand kilograms per meter square, uh, sorry, per meter cubed, okay, so a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. G, uh, we've used 10 a lot, but I, I wanted to do it a little bit more precise for this problem, so I used 9.8 here, so 9.8 meters per second squared for G, and the depth, 10 meters, okay. If you multiply this all out, you're going to get 98,000 Pascal. So you remember that the units, the MKS units for pressure uh, from last lecture uh, was a Pascal and that's a Newton per meter squared and it's pretty small. Okay, it's a small unit. So here we have a pressure of 98,000 Pascals and that is the MKS unit. But you'll generally see that written as kilopascals. Okay, 98 kilopascals. So a swimmer that swims down 10 meters into fresh water can expect 98 kilopascals of pressure on top of their uh, body. Okay. Now the reason I picked 10 meters is because you can compare that to atmospheric pressure. Okay. So atmospheric pressure, and this is the pressure compared to zero pressure, which is a vacuum. Okay. It turns out to be 101.3 kilopascals. All right. So at sea level, because <clears throat> obviously it's less on top of mountains. So, you know, um, if you ever look at weather reports, uh, they'll, they'll sometimes give you the uh, the atmospheric pressure, and that's a good indicator of whether you're going to get a storm or not. Usually, when the pressure drops, there's a storm coming, and usually, when the pressure is a little bit higher than 101.3, that's that's the average, but it can fluctuate above and below. And so, if the pressure is lower than 101.3, expect a storm. If the pressure is higher than 101.3, then you know it's generally uh, good weather, something like that. It's uh, not perfect, but uh, that's the atmospheric pressure, 101.3 kilopascals. Okay. Now, our atmosphere is pretty thick, okay? I, I, I don't know exactly the, the numbers, but, you know, because um, uh, you know, it tapers off. But, you know, it's pretty thick. And so you, you can expect miles and miles and miles of atmosphere of air on top of you. And that leads to 101.3 kilopascals. But only 10 meters of water leads to an extra 98, 98 kilopascals, okay? And why? Well, because the water is just so much denser than air. Okay, and so it takes a lot more air because it's less dense. It takes a lot more air to get the same amount of weight, the same amount of pressure on you as only 10 meters of uh, uh, of water. Okay, so there there you go. Okay, now uh, at this point, um, uh, I should tell you that uh, uh, there's um, uh, a difference. Uh, between what we call gauge pressure and absolute pressure. And it's not that they're two different types of pressure. It's just like, it's, a, it's, it's just a question of how you measure them, okay? And it's not that big a deal in the lecture as much as it is in the lab or when you go out into the real world and you're, you're measuring things like blood pressure. You know, when you put the cuff on your arm and you do the pumping or now it's usually done by machines or whatever, uh, you know, they give you a pressure reading and that pressure reading is actually a gauge pressure. Okay. Or the same thing when you put air in, the, in your tires okay, of, of your car. Uh, that's actually measuring a gauge pressure. In contradistinction to that, there's an absolute pressure. And you go, well, what are, the, what are the two? So whenever we say absolute pressure, we mean what is the pressure compared to the pressure of a vacuum? Okay, And the pressure of a vacuum is 
like there's literally nothing there. So when we say a vacuum, like the vacuum of space, uh, we're saying, you know, there's just nothing pushing up against the object at all in space. Okay. Uh, and so the vacuum of space is a true zero Pascals. And so like when I said a minute ago that the atmospheric pressure at, at sea level was 101.3 kilopascals, that was an absolute pressure that was compared to the vacuum. Okay, so vacuum would have like zero Pascal's pressure and at sea level you would then experience 101.3 kilopascals above or more than the zero Pascal's of a vacuum and that's usually called absolute pressure. Okay, and, and that makes sense. You know, you're measuring the zero there is basically, you know, like no pressure. There's no and there's no such thing as a negative absolute pressure. Why? Well, because there's there's no pressure less than zero. If nothing is pushing on you, you can't have less than some, nothing pushing on you. Okay. So, uh, so that's absolute. But mostly on Earth, whenever we measure pressure, we measure it with some instrument. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll show you one in a minute, a barometer. Okay. And so what we're really measuring there is what's called gauge pressure. And gauge pressure is measured relative to atmospheric pressure. And so there you treat atmospheric pressure as, an, as a zero. Okay, I know it's not zero compared to the vacuum, but you just take it like zero. And so if you say, you know, my the tires in my car have zero pressure, what you're really saying is zero pressure, a uh, gauge pressure, and that just means they have no pressure above atmospheric pressure. So um, the tires in my car, I don't know what it is in kilopascals, but it's a, a, like I have to put 33 pounds per square inch pressure in my tires. That's 33 pounds per square inch above atmospheric pressure. OK, uh, or uh, you could be uh, actually below atmospheric pressure, like if you uh, uh, siphon out a little bit of air out of a container, there might still be some air in the container and it'll be less. In that case, the gauge pressure can actually be negative. It's because it's a little less than atmospheric pressure. So in gauge pressure, the pressure is always being measured relative to atmospheric pressure and atmospheric pressure is kind of taken as the zero. OK, so I hope that's not too confusing, but, you know, usually our instruments are say uh, if, there, if our instrument reads zero it doesn't mean you're in a vacuum it means you're at atmospheric pressure okay and so uh, in a second I'm going to show you the one atmosphere is uh, equivalent to, to um, this other measurement of pressure which is millimeters of mercury uh, so one atmosphere uh, pressure is like 760 millimeters of mercury that's absolute but when you use those blood pressure gauges and you're measuring blood pressure you'll get a like a, a measurement of like 120 millimeters of mercury okay that's actually a gauge pressure what that means is 120 millimeters of mercury above the 760 okay and so that's a gauge measurement and again it's being measured by an instrument has to do with the word gauge okay so so just be careful about that all right and in my problems I'll be very clear you'll you'll know when I want something in term when I give you a pressure I got to tell you am I measuring this pressure against atmosphere or am I measuring it against the vacuum okay again if you're measuring against the vacuum it's uh, absolute and if you're measuring against atmospheric pressure like the difference from atmospheric pressure then it's gauge okay so that 120 millimeters of mercury that's the pressure above the 760 so it's a gauge pressure okay um, there's so many different units for pressure okay uh, it, the MKS is Pascals, and that's what we ultimately have to convert to to do our problems. But uh, you know uh, that 101.3 kilopascals that's that's around so much that like in a chemistry course you might just measure pressure in terms of atmospheres. Okay, so if you have like 101.3 kilopascals, you'll say one atmosphere. If you've got like I don't know like three quarters of an atmosphere, you might put 0.75 atmosphere so that's yet another unit and a third unit that you'll see especially in chemistry are millimeters of mercury and you say how in the world are millimeters of mercury used to measure pressure and that actually goes back to um, um, I think I think it was a student of Galileo Torricelli I think he did it okay I, I don't I don't know that history that well, but he did this experiment that I'm just going to describe to you right now. OK, so what we have down here, all right, you can see where my cursor is, is a pan. And in this pan, we're going to put mercury. That HG is the uh, chemical symbol for mercury. So this is mercury. Mercury is dangerous, so we, we can't really do these experiments. Uh, it's a heavy metal. You don't want to get it on you, you know, uh, so so we don't want to do these experiments in the lab. But, you know, uh, back in the day, they weren't they didn't know about the dangers, so they just did these experiments. But imagine that you have this pan of mercury here. OK, and what you have here is a tube. So you see the tube like that, but the tube is closed at one end. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a tube which is open at one end and closed at one end. Okay, 
Now the tube is upright right now, but before you put it upright, you just lay it inside the mercury and you just fill it with mercury. So it's 100% full of mercury all the way to the top. And then you lift it, you turn it so that the bottom open end is in the mercury and the top end is, is sticking out there like that, uh, is sticking up to, in the air like that, okay? And remarkably, provided that the column of this, that the, the tube length is uh, more than 760 uh, millimeters. Say it's, say it's like a, a meter or something like that. Remarkably, what happens is when you lift the, uh, when you lift this tube up into the air, the mercury falls away from the top. Now this was full all the way to the top with mercury and all of a sudden the mercury falls away from the top. Now, if this mercury fell away from the top there like that, you say, well, what's in there now? It's a vacuum. The mercury literally fell away from the top and left the space in there with nothing there. That's a vacuum. So in this area here from the from the top part of the tube, which is closed to the to the fluid line of the mercury, there's there's nothing. There's a vacuum. OK, and um, uh, you do this experiment and you measure the height from the fluid line here inside the tube to the fluid line in the pan. OK, and you discover that it turns out to be 760 millimeters high. And that doesn't matter what the shape of the tube is, like whether it's, you know, it's got a big cross-sectional area or a small cross-sectional area. Um, you know, the tube, you can move it up and down as long as the bottom always stays, you know, down in the fluid. It's always from, the, from there to there, from the fluid line in the pan to the fluid line inside the tube. It's always 760 millimeters. You go, what's going on? Okay. Why is it doing that? So the way you have to think about this is that um, why is the mercury even flowing up the tube? Why doesn't the mercury just fall right down here? Like if this was opened up here, that mercury line would just drop right down there. Okay. So you say, why does it do that? Don't think of it so much as the mercury, um, I, I don't know, like being pulled up by the vacuum. It's the atmospheric pressure out here. Now I didn't write it here, but out here you've got air. Okay, atmospheric pressure. And that atmospheric pressure is pushing down on this mercury and it pushes down on the mercury and it pushes it up, 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 up. But it can only push it up so far. Why? Because it can only push it up by however much pressure is being applied to the mercury. Okay, so atmospheric pressure is applying a pressure P here and that pressure P there pushes this up such that rho GH is equal to the pressure. OK, because it's the weight of this column here. It's the weight of that column there, which is balancing against the pressure of the air pushing on the outside. OK, does that make sense? So so whatever that column is, it's got a pressure and that's counterbalancing the pressure outside. All right. So if you take rho GH here, P is equal to rho GH, the P that's going to be atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilopascals. But we got to write that in pascals. So kilo is 10 to the three. And I went a little bit fast here, but you just replace that with 10 to the 3 and then move the decimal over twice. And that gives you 10 to the 5 foot. So another way to write it, uh, uh, atmospheric pressure is 1.013 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Okay. So there you go. All right. And so there's the P. G is 9.8. I'm going to use some more accurate numbers here so that we can get a better uh, number out at the end okay by the way on a test or an assignment i'll, ma I'll make sure that i tell you, you know when when it's okay to to round off to 10 uh and when, when you should okay um because sometimes you want a more accurate number okay so uh we want more accurate numbers so we'll use 9.8 here and g uh oh, sorry uh, rho the um the density of mercury turns out to be 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. Mercury is very dense. It's much denser than water. In fact, it's 13.6 times denser than water. Okay. Now converting that to kilograms per meter cubed, remember just multiply by a thousand. So we take here the 13.6 and we multiply it by a thousand, which is 10 to the three. And that gets all of our uh, quantities ready in MKS units. And remember, we're trying to measure H. So all I did here, uh, let me just show you the formula again. So you take this formula here, uh, divide both sides by rho G. Okay, so you get P divided by rho G is equal to H, or H is equal to P over rho G. Plug in all the numbers in MKS, and guess what comes out? 0 0.7601 meters. And converting that to millimeters, remember it's a thousand millimeters in a meter. So that just means move the decimal over three, one, two, three, 700, 
round off to 760 millimeters. Okay, so that's where that 760 millimeters of mercury comes from. All right, it's uh, again, uh, you're balancing the atmospheric pressure here with the pressure due to the weight of the fluid. All right, okay, so uh, uh, this is your barometer. Now, uh, the 101.3, that's your average, but you know, it can go up and down. And so all you have to do is put little markings on the side of your uh, uh, glass cylinder here. And you know, as it goes up and down, you can say, okay, well, you know, today the pressure is 761 millimeters of mercury. And, and maybe the next day it's like uh, uh, 758 millimeters of mercury. You can see the fluctuation from day to day of atmospheric pressure. Okay. All right, there you go. So there's the story with pressure due to being submerged inside a fluid. Next thing we're going to study in uh, fluid statics is Archimedes principle. <clears throat> so Archimedes principle, uh, I got to tell the story. This is a, a classic story that is always told when uh, uh, you introduce Archimedes principle. Archimedes was uh, a Greek uh, scientist uh, living around 200 BC in Syracuse, Sicily. Okay, so that's like in Italy today. And uh, the king wanted to know whether a crown was made out of lead or made out of gold. The, the, the king was worried that it might be lead in the middle and then gold on the outside. But Archimedes wasn't allowed to cut the, um, the, um, uh, the crown because that would ruin the crown. So, so Archimedes said, well, you know what? I'm just going to get the density of the crown. And the density of the crown, if it matches lead, uh, no, then I know it's made of lead or mostly made of lead. And if it matches gold, then I'll know that it's made out of gold. And so it was able to uh, uh, to do this experiment by submerging and weighing the, the crown both in a fluid and outside of fluid. I guess used water, but in water and outside of water and determined that the crown actually did have lead in it. And then they cut it open and uh, the guy who made the crown got in trouble, as you can imagine. And uh, the, the story goes that Archimedes figured this out when uh, he was taking a bath and, uh, you know, in his bath he says i weigh less in the bath than i do in uh in air and so that's that's what gave him the idea and then he ran through the streets of syracuse yelling eureka okay so there's the story of archimedes principle but uh generally what archimedes principle says is that uh, whenever an object is submerged in the fluid there's a buoyancy force there's a force which tends to lift the uh, the object up and the size of that force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid so that's a little bit of a, a brain full so so basically you know when you submerge an object it displaces the fluid it displaces the fluid by the volume of the object if you know the weight of that displaced fluid that's equal to this force the buoyancy force which is trying to push the object up okay so um, I'm going to drive that one for you too because it's not that hard to drive and it gives you an idea of what's going on with Archimedes uh, principle okay so uh, uh, we have an object and it's submerged okay now this object I, I made it into a cube it doesn't matter the shape but i made it into a cube and the object has a cross-sectional area a. so you see the top of this object here whatever that you know, it has a length and a width multiply the two together and that gives you the cross-sectional area and that's a now it also has a thickness to it and i call that d okay d like that now the whole object is submerged the distance h okay so the distance from the fluid line up here to the top of the object is h but the distance from the fluid line to the bottom of the object is h plus d so the top of the object isn't as submerged as much as the bottom of the object okay and so the pressure on the top of the object is actually going to be less than the pressure on the bottom of the object so the pressure on the bottom is bigger than the top and i think you can see where this is going to go the pressure on the bottom is going to be bigger and that's going to try to push it up okay but we can actually get a formula for that because now we've got these two pressures okay and we could say you know what that force the the buoyancy force is going to be the force on the bottom minus the force on the top okay because the bottom is bigger and the force on the bottom remember force is related to the pressure because the pressure is the force divided by the area. So I'm going to take that force and then write it as the pressure on the bottom multiplied by A, the cross-sectional area. And the force on the top is going to be the pressure on the top multiplied by the cross-sectional area. Okay. And now for the pressure here, we've got these two formulas. Here's the pressure on top and here's the pressure on the bottom. So this buoyancy force here, I can take the pressure on the bottom and I can write rho G H plus D. The extra D is to the bottom. Okay. And then minus pressure on the top is rho GH times A. 
Okay, so both of them have that cross-sectional area. And then um, I, I, I skipped a little bit of the uh, algebra here, you know, just uh, distribute this. And then, of course, the rho GHA cancels out. And all you get left is rho GDA. Okay, like that. All right. And now you say to yourself, well, what is that D times A? Well, A is the, show the diagram again. A is the cross-sectional area. D is the height of the object. Cross-sectional area is length times width. D is the height, length times width times height, that's the volume. So whenever you have a cross-sectional area like this and you multiply it by its height, that's going to give you the volume. And I call that VO for the volume of the object, okay? And so there you go. There's the uh, the buoyancy force is equal to rho G V of the object, the volume of the object. And now you say, well, that isn't quite Archimedes' principle because Archimedes' principle was in terms of the weight of the displaced fluid. But then you realize that if I take the density of the fluid, and I multiply it by the volume of the fluid that's displaced, which is the same as the volume of the object, because it's the object that's displacing the fluid, okay, like this. So I just put the rho and the VO together. Rho times the volume of the object, that is the mass of the fluid displaced, okay? So that's the mass of the fluid displaced. Now you take the mass of the fluid displaced, right? Because remember, remember what density is? Density is mass divided by volume. So if you take the density and multiply it by the volume, you get the mass. So that's the mass of the fluid that was displaced. You multiply that by G and what do you get? The weight of the fluid displaced. So that force pushing up is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. And that's Archimedes principle. Okay. So, uh, and then I have it summarized here. Okay. So the, uh, um, uh, the buoyancy force is MG, uh, MF times G, where MF is the mass of the displaced fluid. Okay. All right. Now, um, before we do some problems, I, I should show you that there's two different situations in which you can apply Archimedes principle. One is when you've totally submerged the object, which implicitly is what I've been talking about here. But <clears throat> there's also the situation where the object is floating. Okay. And so um, if you take a look uh, and you, um, even if the object wants to float, you force it underwater. So something like, uh, or under the fluid, something like wood, okay, uh, wood generally wants to uh, float, okay, on water, but let's force that piece of wood underwater and ask what forces are acting on it, okay, so if this is the object here, and, uh, you know, the object still has a weight associated with it, and so the weight of the object is going to be the mass of the object, so that little O there subscript, MO, that's the mass of the object, it's going to be the mass of the object times G, and that's its weight, but then Archimedes principle says there's this force upwards, this buoyancy force, which is equal to the mass of the fluid, okay, that would have been there where the object is, multiplied by G, okay. Now, which one's going to win? If the object is going to sink, okay, so if the object sinks, then obviously the weight has to be bigger than the buoyancy force, okay, so the weight has to be bigger than the buoyancy force, and that just says MO has to be bigger than MF, the 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 mass of the object has to be more than the mass of the displaced fluid. Okay. Now, uh, the let's convert that to densities. The mass of the object is the density of the object times the volume of the object. And the fluid, the mass of the fluid, remember it's the mass of the displaced fluid. Um, you just use the density of the fluid, but now it's the volume of the object because again, the, the displaced fluid, the volume of the displaced fluid is the volume of the object because it's the object that's displacing the fluid. So the mass of the fluid is going to be the density of fluid times the volume of the object. The volume of the object drops out and you get that the density of the object is bigger than the density of the fluid. If that's the case, if the object has a bigger density than the fluid, then the force down is bigger than the force up, it sinks. And that's the condition for sinking. Density of the object has to be bigger than the density of the fluid. Okay, But you can have another situation. You can have the situation where the density of the object is less than the density of fluid. This is some, like my example of wood. So the wood, you could submerge it, but the force, the buoyancy force up is going to be bigger than the weight down. And if you just do this whole analysis again, but just invert the, uh, the inequalities there, okay, then what you get here is when the density of the object is less than the density of fluid, that's when it floats. Okay, so wood floating on water means that the density of wood is less than the density of water. Okay, and you can have that special situation where the density of the object is exactly equal to the density of the fluid, and that's the situation that you want to achieve with a submarine because, in that case, 
the gravity down, the buoyancy force up, they exactly balance, and the object sort of stays suspended there in the fluid. Okay, and in some marines they do that by you know. Um, uh, uh, filling out their 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 bow they have these ballast tanks and if they put water in them then it becomes more dense and if they flood it with air the ballast tanks with air then it becomes less dense and so they can control the density that way and that just keeps the thing you know uh, so so that both of those forces will cancel and it just keeps the thing uh, uh, floating in the water uh, well um, suspended in the water okay so it doesn't want to either go up or down but that's a that's a you know a critical um, situation so it's got to be exactly the two densities have to be exactly equal like that Okay, so there's Archimedes principle. All right, so um, um, let's do uh, our first example, and then we'll actually get to the point where we can use uh, Archimedes principle to measure the density of objects that we submerge, which was exactly uh, Archimedes uh, principle or Archimedes uh, original uh, intention. Okay, so uh, let's let's take a look at whether uh, gold floats or sinks in mercury, or whether lead floats or sinks in mercury and uh, the way we'll do that is by just comparing some densities so the density of gold au is the chemical symbol for gold the density for gold um i i would always give you these numbers okay i don't expect you to memorize them but the density for gold is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter okay the density for lead so and the symbol there is pb okay so the density for lead is 11.3 grams per cubic centimeter and the density of mercury is 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So if I ask the question does gold float or sink in mercury the answer is sink. Why? Because the density of the gold is bigger than the density of the mercury. Okay so the the thing with the bigger density will go down. The gold goes down. Okay so it sinks. But remarkably the density of lead is less than the density of mercury. It seems surprising because mercury is a fluid and uh, lead is, a, is a, a solid, but it's not always the case that, you know, a solid has more density than a, than a fluid, okay, or the liquid. Uh, and it turns out that lead is actually less, and so lead actually floats on top of mercury. So that's, that's kind of remarkable, and, uh, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can just... Uh, um, search for lead floating on mercury and you can see those uh, uh, people doing those experiments. Again, those experiments have to be done very carefully because well, both lead and mercury are, are heavy metals and mercury is, is, is very nasty. So, you know, generally we don't do this in a lab, but, you know, there's lots of uh, people that uh, have videotaped those experiments and you can just take uh, lead and you just put it on mercury and remarkably it just floats on top of it. And you go, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does because the, the density of the mercury is... Uh, bigger the density of the mercury is bigger than the density of lead okay all right so uh now let's go on to uh the actual experiment that archimedes did remember he wants to get the density of this crown submerged in uh in a fluid or in probably water okay and so uh we're going to drive a formula which we're going to use and actually uh you're going to have a lab on this too okay so um we're going to have an object and we're going to have the mass of the object and we're going to call that mo Okay, so this is the true mass of the object. This is actually what its mass is if you were to weigh it on a scale. Okay, now you know when you submerge something in a fluid, it appear it has less weight. Okay, uh, it appears to weigh less, and so it, if you divide OG, it appears to have less mass. We're going to call that M O primed with a little dash there. That little dash means the apparent mass of the object when it's submerged. It's, it seems like there's less of the object there. Okay. The, seems like the mass has disappeared. It hasn't really, really, it's, it still has the same mass. It just appears less because of that buoyancy force, okay? So if you do MO prime times G, that's, we'll call that the apparent weight, okay? And so what is this apparent weight? That's what it appears to weigh when it's submerged. Well, what is that? It's going to be its true weight, MOG, which is the weight down, minus that buoyancy force up, okay? So when you subtract those two together, you get the apparent weight of the object, all right? So then uh, FB, if we just use Archimedes principle, we can replace that with MF, the mass of the fluid times G, okay? And we get this formula here. So the apparent weight is equal to the true weight minus the, uh, the, the buoyancy force, okay? And again, this is submerged, so the entire object is below, uh, okay? And, and so uh, it, it's not sinking, but you know, we've, maybe we've got it on a string like you'll do in the lab, okay? So now what? Well, now I'm just going to rearrange this. I'm going to put both the true mass and the apparent mass on the same side, and that's going to equal this. 
the, uh, the, the MF times G. Okay. And then I'm going to divide out the G and I get that the, um, the, the um, a mass of the object minus its apparent mass is the mass of the displaced fluid. And the mass of the displaced fluid, we can write as the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of the object. Okay. And that's going to give us equation number one. All right. So equation number one basically came from um, the uh, looking at the apparent weight, the, the the weight that you have when you subtract off the buoyancy force from its true weight. Okay, and uh, so it gives us this formula: the the true mass minus the apparent mass is equal to the displaced fluid mass. Okay, equation one. Equation number two is just by definition what the density of the object is. Okay, so the density of the object is equal to the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object, but I'm going to write it like this. Okay, so mass of the object is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object. Okay, and then I'm just going to take equation number two and I'm going to divide it by equation number one. Okay, and I get this equation here. All right. So uh, basically, I just took the uh, left hand side of equation two and I divided by the left hand side of equation one. So here's the equation two left hand side, equation one left hand side. And then on the other side, it's going to be the right hand side divided by the uh, right hand side here. OK, and the volumes cancel out. Both VOs cancel out and we just get this formula here. Now, um, you can see this formula, it could be rearranged in different ways. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to work with it this way because it's just a little easier to work with. In the lab, you might see it. Uh, you might have to rearrange this. OK, but the reason this is nice is because what it has over here is the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. So it has that as a ratio. So the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid as a ratio is equal to the true mass divided by the true mass minus the apparent mass. Okay. Now remember, if the object sinks, the density of the object is bigger than the density of the fluid. So this, the right hand side here would be bigger than one. And that makes sense because you expect the true mass of the thing to be bigger than the difference between the true mass and the, the apparent mass. Okay. So uh, there you go. There's that, there's that uh, equation. And this is for an object that's going to sink. Okay. Now in, in the lab and in the problems that I'm going to do in a minute. I'm going to give you um, uh, three of these things. Like I'll give you maybe the uh, true uh, mass, the fluid, uh, the, the fluid density and the object density. And then I want you to find the apparent or or some combination of that. OK, so I'll give you there are four unknowns here, but I'll give you three and you calculate the other one. Pretty straightforward. OK, uh, and but there's also the other situation. And the other situation is not for objects that submerge, but for objects that float. And now you're in a little bit of a different situation. So here you can imagine this is like the fluid line right here. OK, so here's the fluid line and here is an object, say wood on water, if you need to picture something in particular. And the wood is going to be sticking up a little bit above the water. OK, so there's some volume of the wood which is above the water line and there's some volume of the wood which is below the water line. OK, now we need two volumes here. The first volume is good, we're going to call VO. It's the volume of the object. It's what we've been using up till now. OK, so there's the volume of the object. All right. And uh, we're going to need this VS, which is just the submerged volume. So it's whatever part of the volume of the object is, which is below the fluid line. All right. So that's VS. So again, VO is the entire volume and VS is just the volume that's submerged. OK, now the buoyancy force. This time has to exactly balance the weight of the object. Why? Well, if the buoyancy force were bigger, it would go up. If the mass of the, sorry, the weight were bigger, gravity pulling down and it were bigger, it would go down. So, but it's not going up or down. So it's just sitting there. So what that's, what, what does that mean? That means that the force down, its weight has to balance that buoyancy force up. That's what this equation is saying right here. FB has got to equal MO times G, MO being the mass of the object. Okay. Now the buoyancy force using Archimedes principle can be written as the mass of the displaced fluid times G. And so we get that the mass of the displaced fluid must equal the mass of the object. OK, now here's where it gets a little tricky. The mass of the displaced fluid is not the is not the volume. It doesn't correspond to the volume of the entire object because only the submerged volume of the object is actually displacing fluid. So let's look at that picture again. So you say, well, what fluid is displaced here? Just VS, just the volume VS is displacing fluid. OK, so when you say, all right, here, 
uh, we have this mass of the displaced fluid. What do I multiply it by VO? No, because it's not the whole object that's displacing it. It's just VS that's displacing it. Watch that that's different than above. But because above, when the whole object was submerged, the entire volume of the object was displacing fluid. Here, it's just a submerged volume, which is displacing fluid. Okay. So the mass of the, of the displaced fluid is the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of the submerged uh, part of the object. Okay. And that's got to equal. MO, just using the definition of density, is rho O, rho, density of the object, multiplied by the volume of the object. Okay. Rearranging this equation, we get this. Okay. And here again, I have the ratio of the density of the object to the density of the fluid. All right. Notice that this time, unlike above where this ratio was bigger than one, here the ratio is less than one because the object floats. So its density, rho O, must be less than rho F. So the numerator is smaller than the denominator, so it's less than one. And that makes sense because over here, the submerged volume can't be bigger than the whole volume of the object, okay? So the, the submerged volume is always some, some lesser subset of the entire volume of the object, okay? And so this is Archimedes' principle, but now applied to floating objects, okay? So the two formulas you need are this one, if it's floating, and this one, if the object sinks. Okay, and they'll give you different things. They'll answer different questions, okay? All right, so um, let's do some problems. Okay. So what does 100 gram of gold appear to weigh when submerged in mercury? Okay, remember gold will sink in mercury. So um, let's take some gold, 100 grams of gold. That's probably expensive, okay? Yeah. Uh, but you know, let's take 100 grams of gold and uh, we're gonna maybe tie it to a string or something and we'll just submerge it in the mercury. And when it goes into the mercury, it's gonna appear to weigh a lot less. So what does it appear to weigh? Okay. And so here we use this formula here, which is, uh, you know, Archimedes principle when something sinks. And I'm asking for what? The apparent weight. Okay. Or um, I wouldn't say I'm being sloppy here, but uh, apparent mass would probably be a better way to uh, to say it. So I, here I say how much does it appear to weigh, but let's just uh, calculate the apparent mass, which is M not primed. Okay, don't worry on a test. I'll be I'll be very clear what I want. Okay, so it'll be m not primed like that. So uh, you have this equation here, and I wrote it this way because I wanted rho over rho f. But probably the better way to to use this is to flip it. So you can see here that I just took the reciprocal. So m o is now in the denominator, and m o minus m o primed is now in the numerator. And so I flip the other side too. You can do that as long as you do the same thing to both both sides. And uh, we're solving for m o sorry, MO primed. And so let's isolate that. So what I did here is I have MO minus MO prime divided by MO. So MO divided by MO, that's one. And MO primed divided by MO, that's MO prime divided by MO, like that, okay. And the other side is the same, all right. And then uh, let me just rearrange this. Let me, um, what did I do here? I subtracted rho F over rho O from both sides and I added MO primed divided by MO, just a little bit of algebra in here. Okay, I, I guess I went a little quick because I did two steps in one. But basically, I isolated the MO primed divided by MO. Okay, and that's going to equal 1 minus rho F over rho O, like that. And this is actually another way that you can write uh, Archimedes. Uh, principle, okay? Uh, it just depends. Uh, whichever one you want to use, it, it just depends on on what the, what I'm asking for. Like, am I asking for MO prime? Am I asking for rho O? You know, it just depends on that. And so this this is an alternative way of uh, writing the formula. It might be easier for solving some problems. Either you could use either one. They're totally equivalent, okay? And uh, let's just plug in the numbers. So uh, we want to solve for MO primed. Okay, the apparent uh, mass and the true mass was 100 grams. One minus the density of the fluid, which is mercury, 13.6, divided by the density of the object, gold, 19.3. Now you'll notice I didn't convert it to MKS. I just left it as grams per cubic centimeter. That's okay here. Okay, be careful when you do this and cut cut a few steps. But remember that uh, the the top and bottom they both have the same units. Okay, so we have if we have grams per cubic centimeter on top and grams per cubic centimeter in the bottom, they'll they'll cancel out, and so that's okay. If you don't feel comfortable and you want to convert to uh, MKS, fine. But all it would do is you would have like times a thousand on top and times a thousand on the bottom, and so the thousand on top and bottom would cancel out. Okay, if you could see that, good. If you if you can't, you know you might want to be careful and uh, convert it, but you'll get the same answer. Don't worry. And uh, you know just uh, following through, it turns out that. 
it's only 29.5 grams. So outside of the mercury, the, the gold uh, has a mass of 100 grams, but when we submerge it, it appears to have a mass of 29.5 grams, okay? And in reality, it's still 100 grams because mass is the amount of substance present. But if you were using like a balance to measure this, it would actually only register 29.5. And you say, well, why? Well, because that force, that upwards force is decreasing how much it appears to, to weigh, okay? All right, so... Um, Let's do this now. Uh, how about we take some gold and we um, float it on mercury and we ask the question, what percentage of the lead will sink in the mercury? So what percentage by volume? I didn't say here by volume, but it's kind of implied because uh, this is by volume. Okay, so what percentage by volume of ma of the lead will sink below the mercury? Well, it's, it's really simple because it's just this formula here. Okay, and if we plug in for the density of the object, which is lead, 11.3 divided by the density of fluid 13.6 okay you're going to get 0.83 okay by the way you'll notice here see how it's grams per cubic centimeter on top grams per cubic centimeter on the bottom the the, de the units will just cancel out so that's why you can get away with not converting here to, to mks okay but that 0.83 what does that 0.83 mean that means that the ratio of the submerged volume divided by the total volume is 0.83 well, convert that to a percentage, that's 83%. So 83% of the volume of the mercury, I'm oh, sorry, the volume of the lead will be below the mercury fluid line. Okay? So, um, you know, most of it's below, but there's a little sliver on top. All right? And uh, if you want it precisely, it's 83% of the volume is below the mercury. And uh, I, I, the, I guess it would be 17% above. Okay? All right. Last uh, last um, uh, little tidbit for uh, statics, and uh, this is kind of neat. Uh, this is uh, the topic of hydraulics. Okay, so hydraulics is based on uh, Pascal's principle, and Pascal's principle. Let me just move this down a little bit more so you can see it here. The formula. Pascal's principle basically says, uh, if I have a fluid, and it's uh, an incompressible fluid, okay? Uh, it just doesn't work with like uh, like a gas, like air, okay? So it's got to be uh, uh, like water or, or uh, hydraulic uh, fluid, which is usually some kind of an oil. It, it can't be compressible, okay? Otherwise, this doesn't work, okay? And what compressible means, uh, incompressible means that if you put it in a container and you put pressure on it, it doesn't decrease its volume, okay? You can put as much pressure on this thing and it's not going to decrease its volume, okay? So if you have... Uh, uh, a fluid, an incompressible fluid, and you increase the pressure in the fluid at one side, or one part by a certain amount, the pressure increases everywhere by the same amount. Okay, now that's a little hard to picture. All right, and I didn't even write down um, Pascal's principle because just the way it was verbally stated by Pascal uh, himself, it, it doesn't really um, picture, it doesn't give you the picture of hydraulics. So, so let's look at this uh, picture here and then you'll get a better idea of what's going on here. Imagine that you have a cylinder here, okay? And so here's a cylinder and inside the cylinder there's this piston. So this, this circle right here where my cursor is, that's a piston. And a piston inside of a cylinder is basically the piston can move up and down inside the cylinder, okay? And that you can push down on the piston and it'll move down inside the cylinder. So the piston can move freely inside of that uh, cylinder, okay? And uh, the, the cylinder uh, uh, on the, the right here has a cross-sectional area A, or A2, okay? And there's a piston there like that. Below that piston, the, this uh, area with the dots in it, that's the incompressible fluid here, like that. And it's attached by a line or whatever to another cylinder. And of course, this, this, all, this is all incompressible fluid in here. And this other cylinder also has a, uh, a piston in it, okay? Uh, but it has a different cross-sectional area, and I call that one A1, all right? Now, uh, Pascal's principle says, look, if I increase the pressure here at A2 by just some force F2, okay, I'm going to increase the pressure. Whatever pressure I create here, I'm going to get that same pressure on the other cylinder too, there, okay? And uh, that kind of makes sense because, you know, if I'm pushing down and I'm increasing the pressure there, and the fluid's incompressible. The fluid says, well, I'm just going to communicate that pressure throughout here all the way to the other side, like that, okay? So, uh, you know, this is static, so things aren't moving. But if you just think about it, you know, if this were to move, 
and the fluid's incompressible, the entire volume has to stay the same. So this fluid over here, this, this piston over here would have to move. Okay, and so uh, you know you apply pressure here, you're going to get the same pressure on the other side. And so the pressure on the cylinder to the right here, that's going to be F2, F2 being the force that I apply. Okay, you can see that I'm pushing down there. Okay, so uh, F2, F2 divided by A2, that is the pressure that I've created at the cylinder on the right. The cylinder on the left has to have the same pressure, and so there I'm going to have F1 divided by A1. Okay, pressure again being force divided by area. Okay, so if the if the two pressures here and the two cylinders have to be the same by Pascal's principle, I must have that F1 divided by A1 is equal to F2 divided by A2. Okay, so that's a very simple formula, uh, except that it, it, it's not very intuitive. If you think about it for a little bit, it's not going to be intuitive. Over here, we have a small area and I can apply a small force. Now, a small force divided by a small area might still give me a moderate size uh, force, or sorry, moderate size uh, pressure. But over here, because I have a bigger area, I must necessarily have a bigger force in order for the ratio F over divided by A to be the same. Okay? And so it seems like I can make a bigger force from a smaller force using hydraulics, and you can. You can. So over here, again, I can have a small force over a small area giving rise to a big force over a big area. And it's kind of like I'm, I'm just creating force out of nowhere, okay? And that doesn't make sense. It's like, could I really lift an entire car? I'm gonna do that example in a minute. Can I really lift an entire car with just a little bit of force here? And the answer is yes, you can. And you go, well, why? Uh, and that's because force is not a conserved quantity. It's not conserved, okay? The energy is conserved, but the force isn't. So yes, there's, you know, you got a little bit of force creating a lot of force over here, but if you actually were to lift the car, the amount of energy in joules that you would have to do here would equal the amount of energy in joules that you're actually doing to lift the car. So the energy is conserved, so this doesn't violate conservation of energy, but it doesn't conserve force. It's not like the force here has to be the same as there. So, so that's okay, it can happen. It's just the energies are conserved. And if you wanna know why, I'm not gonna new, not going to need this to solve problems, but but think about it. You know, if you've got a small area here, and if this piston were to move, you'd have to move this piston a lot further here for just a little bit of a lift there. All right. So a large mo movement here for a little lift there. And what is work? Work is force times distance. So you're going to have a small force over a large distance here for a big force over a small distance of displacement there and it turns out that the energies work out now i didn't i didn't prove that for you i don't have to but you could see you know intuitively what's going on okay so yeah you got a little bit of force but you're gonna have to apply that little bit of force over a much longer larger distance here to get a bigger force acting over a smaller distance over there okay so that's what's going on all right. But for our problems, that's just to help your intuition. Okay. Uh, but for our problems, uh, we're just going to use this formula right here. Okay. So let's do a problem. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever um, watched your car when it's being serviced at a garage. Uh, they have to lift it up sometimes so that they can get underneath the car and they lift it up on a hydraulic lift. And if you take a look at the hydraulic lift underneath it, uh, you know, there's the braces that hold the car in place, uh, usually kind of an X shape uh, that go underneath the frame of the car. But there's a huge drum. There's a huge drum that's lifting the, the car. And inside of that drum, they're pumping it with a hydraulic fluid. Okay. And so, um, that's what that's what inspired this problem here. Okay, and you'll also notice that the car goes up very slowly, and that's why because you know uh, the fluid is going in fast, but because the drum has a big cross-sectional area, the the same amount of volume uh, is obtained over a small distance. Okay, all right. So um, the drum of a hydraulic lift has a diameter of 30 centimeters. Okay, so there's a drum and its diameter. Watch it, I said diameter here and not radius. I'm not trying to be tricky, but just, just watch out for that because we'll have to divide by two, okay, so in, a, in a minute. So this is the diameter is 30 centimeters. So from one end of the drum to the other, it's 30 centimeters. By the way, in a lot of these problems <clears throat> and in a lab, you generally work with diameter more than radius. And you might go, why? Because it's easier to measure the diameter because it's from the outside to the outside. For the radius, especially for a drum, you know, like in a, in a garage like that, how would you get to the middle? How would you be able to, 
measured from the middle to the edges. It's just easier to measure from edge to edge. Okay, so if you got the diameter, divide by two and you get the radius. Diameter 30 centimeters, radius would be 15 centimeters. Okay, the fluid in it is fed by a line which has a diameter of one centimeter. Okay, so there's a a line which goes to the to the drum and it's only one centimeter in uh, diameter. Uh, what force do you have to pump the fluid through the line to lift a 1,000 kilogram car? Okay, so you're going to have to push that fluid in through the line. How much force do you require? <coughs> okay, so um, this problem, uh, it, it, the formula for Pascal's principle is pretty easy, but the, the only difficulty here is how do you get those cross-sectional areas? And uh, if it's a drum, the cross-sectional area is the area of a circle, okay? So I don't know if I've uh, given you this formula, but you need to know this formula. The area of the drum is basically the area of a circle, and the area of a circle is given by the formula pi r squared, okay? Where r is the radius, okay? So uh, for our drum, the radius, uh, the diameter was 30 centimeters. The radius then would be half of that, 15 centimeters. And we got to convert that to meters. So 15 divided by 100, move that you would just, you know, move the decimal to the left twice. And that would give you 0.15 meters. Okay, so the radius of a drum in meters is 0.15 meters. All right, so pi 3.14 and 0.15 squared, and it gives you this number here, 0 0.07065 meters squared. Okay, so I skipped some of the details, but I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys could do this calculation. All right, so pi r squared. Now, what about the area of the line? Same thing, but now the line has a diameter of one centimeter, which means a radius of 0.5 centimeters. Converting that to meters, you'd have to divide by 100. That gives you 0 0.005, okay? So let, let's uh, do it here. If, if uh, the decimal right here, we're, we're right there, so just to the left of the five where my cursor is, that's 0.5 centimeters, that's half a centimeter. Divide by 100, that means move the, the decimal to the right twice, and that gives you 0 0.005 meters, okay? So there's the radius of the line. Plug that into the formula pi r squared, and you're going to get 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. Okay, this is a small area, which makes sense. Okay, now the force that the drum has to exert has to lift the car. The car has a mass of a thousand kilograms, but it's going to have a weight of mg, a thousand times 10 meters per second squared for g. Okay, and that's 10 to the 5 newtons. All right, so that F1, let's go back to that diagram here, because, you know, this, this F1 is lifting the car, okay? So that F1 has to be 10,000 newtons to lift the car, okay? And so that F, F1 is 10,000 newtons. We want to know how much force do we have to apply to the fluid. That would be uh, done with a pump, okay? You just basically have a pump. So you would say, well, how much force does that pump have to uh, apply? That's your F2. So if we use our equation for uh, Pascal's principle, F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2, and we're going to solve for F2. So basically here, I'm just going to isolate F2. I, I, what did I do here? I just multiplied both sides by A2, okay? and plugged in the numbers and I got that F2 is 111 newtons. Okay, 111 newtons. So with only 111 newtons, you're able to lift uh, a 1,000 kilogram car. Okay, uh, in other words, exert uh, 10,000 newtons of force. Now, uh, uh, just to give you an idea of like, you know, how big these numbers are, uh, a 1,000 uh, kilogram car, that's actually uh, a little less than the weight of my Honda Fit. Okay, I have a 2017 Honda Fit, and uh, you know uh, they're smallish cars. They're not really small, uh, but you know they're smallish cars. So most cars are about that size, so they're about a thousand kilograms. Okay, so you know maybe bigger, it'd be maybe 1,500 kilograms. Okay, but you know that's the size of a car, and 111 newtons is not a lot. Okay, so if you want to convert that to kilograms, that would be like 11.1 uh, uh, kilograms, the weight of 11.1 kilograms, and in pounds, just roughly multiply by two. That's like 22. Uh, pounds. It's actually uh, uh, kilograms a little bit more than pounds. Say 25 pounds. So with just 25 pounds of force, okay, which you could do yourself, you know, 25 pounds is not that that much force to lift, okay. So with 25 pounds of force, you're able to lift a car using hydraulics, okay. It doesn't seem intuitive, but again, what's going on here is, um, you know, because the pressure has to be the same, if you apply a small pressure over a small area, that's going to turn into a lot, sorry, 
if you apply a small force over a small area, that's going to turn into a large force over a large area. And that's what hydraulics is all about. Okay, so there we go. Uh, this is how, um, how hydraulics works. All right. And uh, we're done now with the fluid statics part. Okay, so everything that we talked about up till now was uh, just about um, uh, the physical properties of, uh, of mostly liquids and incompressible fluids um, uh, when they're not flowing. So we're not really worried about flow. Even though we talked about like in the hydraulics with maybe the fluid moving a little bit, we're not really talking about it flowing, okay, the way it does, you know, when there's like a river or when, you know, like an airplane wing, the air flowing around the uh, the wing and so on, okay. Uh, so uh, fluid dynamics is the subject about the motion of fluids as they move. And you might say, geez, you know, how would I even how would I even follow that? Like, uh, how would I even follow how water moves or things like that? Because, you know, it's, it's all clear. Well, you might imagine putting like a little bit of a, a food coloring or something like that in the water as it flows and just watching the, the flow of that food color. OK, because the food color would just become in, enmeshed in the, in the water and then wherever that water flows, it would just carry the food coloring along with it. OK, or, or you know, like they sometimes do these experiments with like smoke, uh, like in wind tunnels, they'll use little streams of smoke so that you can see how the air is flowing. OK, so uh, fluid dynamics is about that kind of a flow. OK, now um, it's a very complicated subject. So as you can imagine, we're not going to even begin to really dig into uh, fluid dynamics. We're just going to look at what's called laminar flow or smooth flow. Okay, so uh, uh, as opposed to turbulent flow. Okay, so what is this smooth flow? So if you have like here like a wing, so this is like a cross section of a wing. Okay, and you have air flowing around the wing. Well, you know, when the air comes up to the wing, it's got to make a decision. Am I going to go over the top? Or am I going to go over the bottom? Well, you can imagine if the airflow is well above the wing, it just goes over the top, okay? And as it gets closer to the wing, it might get deflected a bit more. Uh, if it hits the wing right on, well, then it's, you know, it's got to go either one way or the other, and then slightly below it, it'll go the other way, okay? Uh, now, if you were to follow the uh, fluid lines by whatever technique you can follow them, you would see that those lines will go around the wing, and then when they get to the other side, they, they just smoothly join up together, and okay? And this is known as laminar flow. Okay, or just smooth fluid flow. Okay, this we can study. This we can study. Okay, and it generally happens when the velocity of the fluid is not too fast. But you can imagine that as you start to turn up the velocity of the fluid, and of course it depends on the shape of the object that the fluid is flowing around. As you start to turn up the uh, the, the the speed, okay, that what happens is the lines at the other end of the object. Uh, don't meet up, don't quite meet up, and you get into what's called turbulent flow, okay? And if you had like, a, like if these were like smoke lines, what you would see is a bunch of like little, uh, uh, little um, uh, turbulent uh, uh, vortices, okay? And the other end, and I, I mean, I can't really draw them, so I just drew these like little curly cues in there, okay? So the, you know, the, those are like these little vortices that start to form, and you could see that the flow in there becomes quite turbulent, okay? Well, that's the name, turbulent. It becomes chaotic. It doesn't settle down into any kind of a, a, a smooth flow. The The study of that kind of motion is not something that we can address, okay? There are equations that look at that, okay? Uh, like the Navier-Stokes equations, but they're far beyond the scope of this course. In fact, uh, mostly it's not even a, a subject of physics. This is almost like its own branch of engineering, okay? And, you know, people that design airplanes or people that design cars, they want to reduce this kind of flow, they like the laminar flow because that's when you're going to get the best, uh, the least amount of drag, and therefore the the best gas mileage. Okay, so so we're only going to look at laminar flow. Now within laminar flow, there's basically two equations that uh, govern this flow. Okay, so you could think of them as kind of like uh, Newton's laws, but for fluids. All right. Uh, in fact, and this is what's remarkable, but again, far beyond the scope of the course, you can actually derive these equations using Newton's laws. And you go, wow, how would you do that? Well, you have to model the fluid as being made up of little molecules and the molecules interact with one another. OK. And in fact, uh, one of the papers that I wrote um, back when I was at Cornell uh, was actually on 
deriving these equations, but not from Newton's laws, from an even deeper, from the quantum mechanic equivalent of them, from uh, Schrodinger's equation. So you can actually start with the dynamics of um, uh, like uh, the, the, not Newton's laws, but the mechanics of like the, at the microscopic level, at the quantum mechanical microscopic level, and you could still derive these equations. Okay, so um, these are the equations for laminar flow. Okay, anyhow, what are they? One of them is known as the continuity equation. It's the first one we'll study, and it's basically based on the conservation of matter. Okay, and it basically says, look, if so much fluid flows into an area, then the same amount of fluid has to flow out of the area. Okay, otherwise fluid is either being created or destroyed. Okay, and uh, um, actually this is again for incompressible fluids. All right, and you'll see that in, in a minute. Okay, and the second equation is known as Bernoulli's equation, and Bernoulli's equation is actually based on conservation of energy. Okay, and so it basically says something like if you measure the entire energy density of the fluid here, it has to be the same energy density throughout the entire fluid. Okay, and again, I'll define that in a minute, but basically, they're both based on um, conservation laws. All right, so let's start off with the continuity equation. It's the easiest of the two, and I'll, I'll uh, do a very quick derivation to give you an idea of how it works. Okay, so this is for an incompressible fluid. All right, so uh, again, like water is pretty incompressible. And uh, what you have to picture here is a tube, okay? Uh, like some kind of a duct through which uh, air can flow. Or, uh, no, not air, because air can, water can flow, okay? Uh, but it's not of the same cross-sectional area everywhere, okay? So over here, we have a larger cross-sectional area, A1, okay? So this is where the fluid is going to flow in with a velocity V1. So the fluid flows into this tube, uh, with a velocity v1 where the tube has cross-sectional area a1. It flows through the tube and then it exits the tube with a velocity v2 at the point where the tube has a cross-sectional area a2. Okay, so flows in with velocity v1 at cross-sectional area a1, flows out with velocity v2 at cross-sectional area a2. Now if this is an incompressible fluid and of course matter is neither created nor destroyed, the amount of fluid flowing in during any period of time must equal the amount of fluid flowing out. Okay? Uh, why? Well, if, if the amount of fluid flowing in is different than the amount of fluid flowing out, either fluid was created or destroyed, or maybe it got compressed, but neither of those are possible because we assume that they weren't possible. Okay? So let's just consider some time delta t, some short little period of time delta t. Okay, a second, half a second, doesn't matter. Well, uh, imagine the fluid, it's uh, like some, like, again, you know, like maybe you got some food coloring so you can watch it. The food coloring just starts here at the very edge at t equals zero, and then a time delta t later, it's the whole fluid front has traveled the distance delta x1. So in that time delta t, and that time delta t, the fluid has traveled at, the, at where it's cross-sectional area a1, where the cross-sectional area is A1, the fluid in time delta T has traveled the distance delta X1. At the same time, during that time interval delta T, at A2, the fluid will have traveled a distance delta X2. Okay? Now, the fluid going in must equal the fluid going out. The volume of the fluid going in must equal the volume of the fluid going out. So what's the volume of the fluid going in in that time delta T? Well, the volume is going to be the cross-sectional area, A1, multiplied by the height. Well, it's not height here because it's sideways, but multiplied by that delta X1. So the volume of the fluid going in is A1 times delta X1. The volume of the fluid coming out must equal A2 times delta X2. Okay, And that's, again, the assumption that uh, matter is conserved and that it's an incompressible fluid. Okay. And so we have this formula right here. A1 delta X1 is equal to A2 delta X2. Okay. Now let me divide both sides by delta T. All right. So if I divide both sides by delta T, I'm going to have A1 delta X1 divided by delta T is equal to A2 delta X2 divided by delta T. But now if you say, look, if I travel a distance delta X1 and time delta T, that's just your V1. Right, because velocity is the distance traveled divided by the time it takes to travel it. So at A1, it is traveling with velocity V1, so delta X1 divided by delta T is V1. And at A2, it's V2, 
and there you go there's the continuity equation very simple okay uh, I did want to derive it for you because I really wanted to you know if I just throw it at you, you may go I don't know why why is that true it's true because the volume of the fluid going in has to equal the volume of the fluid going out in, in the same amount of time okay and so when you divide both sides by the time you're gonna get velocities there all right and uh, intuitively how, what does this mean it basically says that the velocity is biggest wherever the cross-sectional area is smallest okay so you know if you start from a big tube and the tube starts to squeeze down in cross-sectional area the fluid has to speed up as the cross-sectional area uh, decreases okay and then it might be going fast and then as it maybe opens up into a, uh, an area uh, into a region with bigger a then the fluid will slow down okay and uh, if anyone's played with a garden hose uh, you know this imagine a garden hose and you just got the water um, flowing out the top okay so it's flowing at some moderate speed and you know the garden hose has a cross-sectional area like this at the mouth and then what do you do you put your thumb on top of it and what are you doing you're decreasing the area and what happens the water squirts out faster okay and so if you want to squirt your friend you just put your finger on top of it you know because you're just normally watering it but you put your finger on top of it you decrease that area the water will squirt out faster okay so that's basically what this equation is um, is um, uh, saying okay let's do a problem these are pretty simple problems um, so here we go. Now I made this one just a little bit more uh, interesting. So uh, what I have here is, and I was thinking of maybe something like arteries or um, in, in the human body, something like that. Although arteries are a little bit tricky because they balloon out in and out. So the cross-sectional area changes, but let's, let's just assume that, you know, the, there's no change in the, any of the areas here. So, so here we got, uh, you know, um, a tube and the uh, fluid is flowing in with a velocity V1 through this circular area here and that one has a diameter d1 of two centimeters so i'm not giving you the area directly i'm giving you giving you that area indirectly by telling you the diameter there and it actually exits through two of these and because um, uh, it splits and I, I guess i didn't draw the fluid flow in here but it's kind of obvious it flows there and it flows through there so it's got it flows out and flows out of both of them with the same velocity and uh, this top one has a diameter of 0.5 centimeters and this bottom one has a diameter d3 of one centimeter okay so so there's two different diameters for the exit okay and you go well how is this going to work well it's the same idea as above the the fact that it splits here don't don't let that be a, uh, at all tricky. It's it's just the sum of these two areas. It's basically this A1 is like the area in and A2 is the sum of the areas out. So you just take that area there because it's an exit and you take that area there because it's also an exit and add them together and that's the area of the total exit. Okay, the total area of the exit. Okay, so um, I got to give you the velocities and so here I say a fluid flows with velocity V1 equals 20 meters per second in Okay, how fast does it flow out? Okay, so I, I want you to calculate V2 there. And assume the, flu, the flow is the same through both exits, okay? Um, all right, so um, for A1, which is the area right here, okay, we want to use um, pi r squared again. Uh, I said R1 here because it's D1. And, and be careful because we want the radius. Now the diameter I said was two centimeters, so the radius is one centimeter can see it there okay and so I said here even uh, uh, use R not D okay A typical mistake that's made okay and the other thing I'm gonna say is we can actually work in centimeters and not convert to meters and you go why why will that work well it'll work because let's look at this equation here see this area here suppose that I, that area instead of converting to meter squared we work in centimeter squared and that a2 we also work in centimeters squared guess what the units will cancel out on both sides okay so for some equations that works and if you notice that you know uh the it's linear on both sides so you have an area on this side and an area on that side and you go you know what i want to just save myself the work of having to convert to to meters uh it'll work out because the units here will be centimeters squared and the units there will be centimeters squared if you really want to see it leave the units in the equation you'll see that they cancel out okay so um so over here we have a1 is equal to pi r1 squared that's pi times one centimeter squared and if you just work that out that turns out to be 3.14 centimeters squared okay so that's the area of a1 now what about the area of a2 it's also pi r squared but with r2 okay and um the diameter there i think was 0.5 let me just make sure yep okay you can see it over here 
Uh, scroll down a bit more. Okay, so you see over here, D2 is 0.5 centimeters. So R2 is going to be 0.25, half of that. Okay, so over here, uh, 0.25 centimeters squared. And if you just work this out, that's going to be 0.19625 centimeters squared. A3 uh, a, a3 had a diameter of one centimeter, so half of that is 0.5 centimeters, and work that out, it turns out to be 0.785 centimeters squared, okay? Now the total exit is both A2 and A3, because the fluid is exiting out of both of those, okay? And so it's, the total exit is going to be that one, 0.19625 plus the 0.785, and that gives me 0.98125 centimeters squared. Okay, now when we go to plug into the equation, and I probably should have used different symbols here, but the equation is like A1, uh, V1 is equal to A2, V2, but that A2 in the equation, that's the total exit, and so that's the that total there, okay? And so what do we want to solve for? We want to solve for V2 because I gave you everything else, so divide both sides by A2, and we get uh, um, A1 was 3.14 centimeters squared. I probably should have left the units there so you could see that the units in A1 will cancel the units in A2. They're both centimeters squared. Okay, but uh, A1 was point, uh, sorry, 3.14 centimeters squared multiplied by V1, 20 meters per second, uh, divided by um, A2, uh, the total exit, which is 0.98125 centimeters squared, and that gives uh, 64 meters per second. Okay, so uh, the fluid flows in at 20 meters per second and it flows out at uh, 64 meters per second and so that answers this this problem okay so um you know not to be uh, too tricky but um all i'm saying here is look uh uh in this equation a1 and a2 just treat a1 as like the total area in a2 as the total area out even if it splits it doesn't matter Okay, so there you go. There's the continuity equation. So uh, that's going to say something about how a fluid flows, but it's not everything. There's the um, the second equation, which is based on conservation of energy, and it's Bernoulli's equation. Okay, and uh, Bernoulli's equation again for any one of these laminar flows, if you can calculate this quantity here, and I'll go over it in a minute. If you can calculate that quantity there at any point in the fluid, it's the same everywhere in the fluid. Okay, so it's a, it's this kind of a conservation law, all right? So uh, basically, you know, like you just say, oh, it's uh, so many joules per meter cubed here. Well, there's got to be so many joules per meter cubed everywhere in the fluid, all right? So what is this quantity, this conserved quantity? Well, it's P, the pressure of the fluid at that point, plus one half rho V squared, rho the density, V the velocity of the fluid at that point. Remember, we've got flow now. Okay, so V here is uh, not a volume, it's small, small V. Okay, lowercase V is the velocity of the fluid squared plus rho GH. Okay, like that. Okay, and, and that's equal to a constant throughout the fluid. And um, you look at this and you go, hmm, one half rho V squared. That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like one half MV squared. And last semester, one half MV squared, kinetic energy. So this is a kinetic energy like. We'll look at it in a minute. And over here, rho GH, well, you saw that a minute ago. That's the pressure as you submerge down into a fluid. But rho GH sounds an awful lot, a lot like, in energy, MGH. Remember MGH from last semester? Potential, uh, potential energy due to gravity. But now it's rho GH and not MGH. And you go, well, what's going on here? This, lo these, this looks like a kinetic energy. And that looks like a uh, potential energy due to gravity. And then there's this other P. Okay, the pressure, what is that? And so um, if you take a look at each of these terms, you'll actually see that they're an energy density. And what that means is an energy per unit volume. Okay, so you take a look at the one half rho v squared. Remember that rho is density and that's mass divided by volume. So I, I made this extra big V here. Okay, you can see my V with the like the little ticks on the end. That's volume. I'm trying to show that it's a capital V, so not not a lowercase v. Okay, not too many uh, symbols. Uh, so so that V there, that big V there, that's volume, and this little V here is velocity. Okay, so but remember that density is mass divided by volume. Okay, and so if I write my row as m over v, and then I just collect together one half m v squared, the one half m v squared, that's a kinetic energy, and v is a volume. So the one half rho v squared is your kinetic energy density. Okay, <clears throat> it's how much kinetic energy there is in the fluid per unit volume. Okay, and the rho gh do the same thing. Just write the rho as m over v, 
And here you can take the MGH together, and MGH is a potential energy, and divided by the V, the volume, that's your gravitational potential energy per unit volume, again, an energy density. And then you go to the pressure. What's that? Is that an energy density too? Yes, remarkably, you could even interpret the pressure as an energy density. Now, previously, when I first defined pressure, I said pressure was the amount of force per unit area. And that's a, definitely a correct way to think about pressure. But there's another way to think about pressure, and it is as an energy density. And you say, how can I, how is it an energy density? Well, all three of these quantities have to have the same units, joules per meter cubed in MKS. And so does pressure really have the units of joules per meter cubed? The answer is yes. If you take pressure, the MKS units for pressure are Pascals. Pascals, following the interpretation of force per unit area, are newtons per meter squared. But now if I multiply both the top and the bottom by a meter, I get a newton meter divided by a meter cubed. And what's a newton meter? Remember work? Work is a force over an area, uh, sorry, force over some distance. So that's a newton times a meter. A newton times a meter is a joule. And so a Pascal could be either thought of as a newton per meter squared, but it can also be thought of as joules per meter cubed. Okay, so pressure is like an energy density. And at this point, you're going, how do I picture that in my mind? Like you could definitely picture pressure as a force over an area because it's like, you know, take the palm of your hand, it has an area and you're going to apply a force, but you're not going to apply a force like to at a point, you're going to apply a force all over your, your hand. And you know, there's a pressure and you feel that pressure when you push up against something. But how do you picture it as an energy density? And uh, the best I can do for you is you can think at the microscopic level. At the microscopic level, uh, the atoms and molecules, remember in a, in a liquid, they're sitting up against one another. Okay, they're not they're not totally hard solids. Okay, they're a little bit soft at the edges, and that's because you, uh, molecules are made out of like it's the electrons on the outside. Okay, and uh, when the electrons start to overlap with one another, these things the, the atoms start to push away. Okay, when they're further apart, they tend to attract, and when they're close together, they tend to repel. Okay. But you can imagine if you have pressure, what are you doing? You're squishing the fluid together. At the microscopic level, you're squishing the atoms together. And when you squish them together, what do they want to do? They want to spring apart. Spring apart. It's like the molecules at the microscopic level have a little bit of a spring constant between them. And you know that there's, an, there's a potential energy associated with the spring constant, one half kx squared. And so as these molecules get squished together, at the microscopic level, there's a bit of a of a potential energy between them. And if you let go of that pressure, you know, or allow it to expand, it'll it'll expand back out. Okay. And so that's the best I can do. It gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on at the microscopic level. You're squishing, even though it's incompressible, it means the volume's not going to change. You're still push trying to overlap these atoms. And there's a spring constant associated with them. And you know, wherever you have a spring constant and you're squishing things together you're decreasing that x okay remember the potential energy to a spring is one half kx squared it's like you've got a whole bunch of little springs in there a whole bunch of little one half kx squares and they add up to some energy okay now that energy is distributed throughout the fluid um, throughout the fluid and there's so much energy per unit uh, volume and that's why pressure can be thought of as joules per meter cubed. Okay, I hope that helps. All right, so let's go back here before we jump in and start using this uh, this equation. And you can see that uh, what this basically says is the energy is evenly distributed throughout the fluid. That's that's the Bernoulli's principle. It's this quantity is constant throughout the fluid. But at any point, there might be more energy in pressure. There might be more energy in the flow, the speed of the flow, the kinetic, or there might be some energy just because it's up higher than there is elsewhere. Okay, so let me say that again, no matter where you are in the fluid, the this total is the same. Okay, say it's, I don't know, I'm going to just make up a number, 10 joules per meter cubed. So everywhere in the fluid, it's 10, 10 joules per meter cubed. But at this part of the fluid, most of that energy might be in pressure. In this part of the fluid, that's this is where it's flowing, most of that energy might be in kinetic and maybe in another part of the fluid, it's up higher than down here. Up here, it's mostly in potential, gravitational potential energy. Okay, so, uh, you know, the distribution between these three is, <clears throat> might be different, but the total is the same throughout the fluid. That's Bernoulli's principle. Okay, 
Let's do some problems with it. We're going to do two problems. Bernoulli's principle can be very tricky, so we're going to do two problems, and and um, I'll I'll try to you know uh, make sure we nail all the the subtleties of it. Okay. So um, uh, what do I have here? Uh, I have a beaker of a um, fluid. And I don't know what fluid I'm using here. Oh, water. Okay. So a uh, beaker contains water. And we poke a hole in this beaker three centimeters below the fluid line. Okay. You could see a hole here like that. Okay. And the hole is small. Okay. And the reason I made the hole small is so that the fluid doesn't flow out quickly. Okay. And um, so the, in other words, that fluid line is going to drop, but not, it's going to drop very, very slowly. Okay. And so there's a hole here. And I want to know how fast does the fluid flow out of that hole? Easy question. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, Bernoulli's principle, and what you do is, remember Bernoulli's principle says that any two points in the fluid, that sum has to be the same. So you pick two points, one point where you can calculate the total energy density, and another point where you have the one unknown. This is an awful lot like the roller coaster right where you can calculate the energy at one point in the roller coaster and then that allows you to calculate you know the unknown quantity at some other point because the numbers are the same because of conservation okay this is the same idea so over here in this beaker we're going to take the two points as point number one where we have all the information we need to calculate that energy density and then the other point is going to be point number two and that's right in the middle of the stream when it's exiting the, the the beaker okay so so i didn't draw it here it's kind of hard to draw but imagine there's a little, you know like a, a stream that's flowing out and of course it'll bend down because of gravity but there's a stream flowing out there a little a little stream of uh, fluid and uh, of, of water and right in the middle of that fluid uh, that flowing fluid we're going to put in a point number two so point number one and point number two have to have the same energy density same total energy densities by Bernoulli's principle okay and because we need rho gh we got to choose an h equals zero we're going to choose h equals zero right here at the level of point number two okay so point number one is actually three centimeters at an h of three centimeters okay all right so let's start um Let's calculate this quantity, P plus 1 half rho V squared plus rho GH at both points 1 and 2. At point number 1, the pressure is 0 uh, pascals. Okay, we're assuming we're at atmospheric pressure. Uh, and now it, you're going to say, wait a sec, wait a sec. Didn't you say atmospheric pressure was 101.3 kilopascals? Yeah, absolute pressure, but let's work in gauge. At gauge pressure, one atmosphere is 0. Okay, so if you had an instrument that was measuring the pressure against atmospheric pressure, you're measuring atmospheric pressure against atmospheric pressure, it's zero. Okay, and that's why I put gauge there. Okay, uh, what about the one half rho v squared? Well, I said that the fluid line is moving very, very slowly. In fact, negligibly small. So it, it is moving a little bit, but let's say it's moving so slow that we might as well say that's zero too. Okay, and one half rho v squared, it also has the units of pascals. Okay, because joules per meter cubed is in pascals. And so that means that the only contribution to the energy density is rho gh. Okay, and rho gh here, rho, we we're, we're using water, so that's density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. G, we'll use uh, 10 meters per second squared. Okay, and h is 3 centimeters. 3 centimeters in meters is 0 0.03 meters. Okay, so we work that out and we get 300 pascals. So the pressure zero because we're at atmospheric pressure gauge okay on uh, one half rho v squared it's not flowing there the fluid's not moving there so zero and rho gh it is three centimeters above our h equals zero so that gives us 300 pascals <clears throat> what does that mean we calculated it there but we calculated it right there but anywhere in this fluid anywhere in this fluid if you calculate that quantity and even into the stream and even as the stream drops like anywhere along here, okay, inside the, the la that laminar flow, the energy density is 300 pascals, okay? Kind of neat. All right, now let's look at point number two. At point number two, we're back out into the atmosphere. And so again, we're at zero uh, pascals gauge, okay? And uh, if you wanted to put 101.3 kilopascals, you would have had 101.3 at both points. It would have canceled out. So it doesn't change it. I just like working in gauge pressure when I'm talking about atmospheres, because uh, at least for Bernoulli's equation, because it's, it's just a zero. 
Okay. What about the one half rho v squared? Well, now it is flowing because the fluid is moving there. And so we don't know v, so that's going to be our unknown. But we do know a half, well, a half u. Okay? And, and rho is a uh, thousand, so it's a half times a thousand. So that's 500 v squared. Okay. We don't know v, but we'll find that. Okay. And what about rho gh? Well, we chose h equals zero at point two. So rho gh at that point is zero pascals. So all the contribution to the energy density there is going to come from the one half rho v squared. Okay. And so the sum of all three of those is going to be 500 v squared. Okay. Now Bernoulli says that that 300 pascals at point one must equal the 500 v squared at point two. And so working that out, that gives us a velocity of 0.775 meters per second. Okay. And that's how fast the fluid would uh, would be flowing out at the bottom at that hole. Okay. Uh, I guess 77.5 centimeters per second. Okay. Which is pretty fast, but th there it is. Okay. Um, uh, I could have done it uh, uh, at different points here. Uh, obviously, if you're uh, like at less than three centimeters, it'll flow slower. And if you're at more than three centimeters, it'll, it'll flow out uh, faster. Okay. So there you go. There's one example of uh, Bernoulli's principle. Now, um, I wouldn't say it's a boring example, but uh, it, it doesn't bring in the pressure and it doesn't show how the pressure is actually an energy density. And so that's what my uh, next example, my last example is going to be all about. It's a syringe. Okay, and so uh, here we go. We have a syringe here, and what's a syringe? It's basically a cylinder with a piston in it. And I'm going to apply a force to the piston. You know, squeeze in the syringe there like that. And inside here we have a um, uh, a, a fluid, an incompressible fluid. And of course, there's a little needle, and it's going to come out through the needle there like that. Okay, and um, the syringe here, I'm going to say it has a diameter, so it's it's circular with a diameter of one centimeter, so one point zero. Uh, centimeters there like that okay and uh, the fluid when it flows out it's going to come out with a velocity of 10 meters per second okay and uh, we always use water so this time I said you know what let's use ethanol and ethanol has a density of 0 0.79 grams per centimeters cubed I'm sorry this is a little hard to read there but that is 0 0.79 grams per centimeter cubed okay by the way I, I i would give you all the densities the only density i expect you to remember is the density of water and that's because it's a special number in the metric system okay one gram per cubic centimeter or a thousand kilograms per cubic meter that one you should have memorized and it's not that hard to memorize okay but any other fluid like why should you know the the density of ethanol so ethanol is the um is the alcohol that we can drink you know there's also methanol which is poisonous to us but ethanol is the 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 type of alcohol that we you know that we can drink uh, uh metabolize and it has a density of 0.79 grams per cubic centimeter okay and it's going to exit with a velocity of 10 meters per second now i want to know how much force do i need to to squeeze to get to get that fluid to flow out at that speed okay so at point number one I didn't give you the pressure. So, oh, I didn't say where point number one was. So the two points, you get to choose where they are, but choose wisely. One point is obviously in the fluid stream for the same reasons as above, because that's where one of our unknowns. Uh, 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 no, it is an unknown, but that, that's where we have all the knowns there. Okay, so point number two is actually a point where we know have all the knowns and we can actually get the total energy density. At point number one, that's where we have one of the unknowns, which is going to be the force. Now, I didn't give you... Uh, that's not in the equation directly, but the force divided by the area equals the pressure that is, okay? So even though I'm asking for the force, just remember that the force distributed over an area, that's the pressure. So we're going to get the pressure at point number one, and uh, uh, and that's going to be, you know, in that equation, it's going to be equal to uh, the energy density at point number two, okay? So at point number one, the pressure is whatever force, the unknown force, divided by the area of the cylinder, okay? And the area of the cylinder is going to be pi r squared, and uh, r is half of d, so uh, d was one centimeter, so that would be half a centimeter, or 0 0.005 meters, okay? And that turns out to be an area of 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared, okay? So the pressure at point number one is f, r unknown, divided by that area. Okay. And I did it in meters squared. Okay. By the way, in this one, you have to work in MKS units because the units will not cancel out in any easy way otherwise. 
Okay, work in pascals, in other words. The um, uh, the uh, uh, kinetic energy density there, the one half of rho v squared, that's zero. Okay, and the reason again is I'm going to make the assumption that the fluid squirts out here. So yeah, the plunger will move forward, but let's assume that the that the, the needle is so thin there that the plunger moves forward very slowly. And so we can ignore that velocity there. We'll say it's of a negligibly small velocity, okay? And so that's zero there. And also, uh, I'm gonna say rho gh is uh, zero there, okay, why? Well, because both point number one and point number two, they're both at the same height. And so I didn't even even write h equals zero there, but you can see that if both points are at the same height, it, it doesn't matter, okay? So we'll say rho gh is zero there and rho gh is zero there as well, okay? All right, so um, all the contribution at point number one comes from the pressure, all right? And that's gonna be whatever force I'm applying divided by the cross-sectional area. All right. So you can see how this is different than above. And above, uh, the pressure at both points one and two was zero pascals gauge. Okay. Uh, here, the pressure at the, just behind the plunger is going to be whatever force I'm applying divided by the cross-sectional area. At point number two, the pressure is zero pascals gauge. Okay. Because it's out into the air. It's it's been released down to the air, and and uh, there's nothing pushing it on it. Okay. Uh, one half rho v squared. It is flowing. And so it's going to be one half. The density is 790 kilograms per meter cubed. 0.79 grams per cubic centimeter is multiplied by a thousand to get it into kilograms per meter cubed. 790 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. And then G, uh, sorry, uh, V, V, uh, I said was 10 meters per second. Okay. And so multiplying that all out, I get 39,500 pascals. Okay and rho gh zero for the reasons I just said, okay? So if we add all those together at point number two, the only contribution is from uh, one half rho v squared. And so the total energy density at point number two is 39,500 joules per meter cubed, okay? So 39,500, that's gotta equal the total energy density at point number one and above, we determined that that was that just the force divided by the cross-sectional area, and so we equate the two. This is that that e that equality there is true because of Bernoulli's principle, and then just solve, and it turns out to be 3.1 newtons, which is very little. Okay, and as you would expect with a needle, you know, you're not gonna you don't have to push very hard with a needle, and you're gonna get quite a a, a, a fast stream. Uh, flowing out. Okay, so that solves the problem. Let's go back and just see what's going on there. So here, everything is at the same height, so the rho gh is gone. Okay, at point number one, all the energy is in p, all the energy density is in, in the pressure. Okay, and at point number two, all the energy density is in the kinetic energy density. And so what's happening here is pressure is being turned into kinetic energy. Okay, and you can imagine what's going on. You're squeezing in on this. In here, the molecules are kind of being squished together. So they've got that, that like uh, spring potential energy between molecule to molecule interaction. Okay, and what happens is that energy is released out here and it becomes kinetic. Okay, so pressure can be turned into kinetic energy and, and it would, you know, cause the fluid to squirt out. Okay, um, that's it for the... Uh, uh, fluid dynamics and that's it uh, for fluids. All right. So uh, thank you very much for listening.